In the lagoon near Venice, on the island of San Lazzaro, there's been an Armenian monastery since the 17th century. In the 1920s, many young Armenians who'd been orphaned in the genocide came here. They'd seen terrible things. Priests crucified on their altars. Starving women eating their own children. Horseshoes nailed to the feet of living men. One of these survivors is now an 80-year-old monk. Even here, in the safety of Venice, he's too frightened of the Turks to reveal his name. Hanno preso il mio padre e hanno portato come che dovevano fare soldato perché era c'era la guerra e avevano bisogno certamente di soldati, ma non hanno non hanno dato mai fucile o spada a questi. Erano una, un esercito di operai per costruire strade e così quando mi hanno detto che quando è finito questo lavoro di fare strade, di costruire strade, hanno massacrato tutti. Tutti gli operai armeni hanno massacrato tutto, tutti. As a tiny child, he learned his parents' Christian names only from overhearing two Turkish soldiers who'd been in the squad that took them away. His trauma is made truly nightmarish by the continued denial of Turkish governments that the genocide ever took place. Questo forse un po' di una questione psicologica perché il genocidio è una parola che suona male è un delitto internazionale e i turchi hanno paura di, di essere conosciuti e, con questo delitto dunque genocidio non vogliono sentire il nome di genocidio ma intenzione dei turchi era proprio il genocidio. The monastery library is a treasure house of the ancient culture of Armenia, the world's first Christian state. It houses not only priceless manuscripts, but like many Armenian institutions around the world, documentary evidence that the 1915 massacres really did happen. The massacres annihilated an entire culture. The greatest Armenian composer, Komitas, lost his reason because of them. The poet, Daniel Varujan, was killed. His work uncannily prefigures the catastrophe to come. <laughs> Chartovaznerun takal nean vorgovi kerezmana duna hayot. Arevan hedin ir shogerov gusapre varam badank mavoskezot. Tin nihare huns ne ait ir jant dererun. An hazif has gadani agansner nirgahat karzez horasuis ke mert merta tekani tarer betken shamanelu hamar hus. Marakan Hansabat Surperun, Yev Shirchaga Baderun, Bochen Ir Dadan, Kasarske Mish, Mish Aru. Kemal Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey, is celebrated among his own people for restoring the national honor after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Ataturk set up a modern secular state, but at a price. That price was glorification of the army. In Turkey, the army is the power behind the throne. It has frequently overturned elected governments. 
Turkey is built on twin myths of military superiority and racial purity. These, and unacknowledged guilt feelings, are the reasons why all Turks, even the most liberal and westernized of them, passionately deny there ever was an Armenian genocide. Above the modern town of Kozan stands the ancient citadel of Sis, capital of the last independent Armenian state, which was overrun by Muslims in 1375. But though their fortresses fell, the Armenians lived on. All over the Ottoman Empire, in cities like this, there continued to be Armenian communities with their own churches and schools right up to the First World War. In 1915, they numbered over two millions, many of them concentrated in their traditional heartlands in northeast Turkey. Today, there are scarcely 40,000 left. Turkey's Armenians have simply vanished. In the cities of the empire, the Armenians were an elite. They were lawyers, doctors, merchants, metal workers, professional people and skilled craftsmen. On the land, where they'd lived for over a thousand years before the Turkish conquerors arrived, they were hard-working peasants. All were fervent Christians. Their religion and their relative prosperity made them outsiders and exposed them to envy. So in 1915, they were struck down. They were marched off never to be seen again. Their homes and goods were confiscated. A population which had lived in the same place for centuries suddenly became non-persons. Their abandoned churches were knocked down or used for stabling animals or converted into mosques. Since then, ancient churches and monasteries have continued to suffer. The Turks have at best neglected, at worst dynamited them. In modern Turkish guidebooks, you'll search in vain for the word Armenian. This desolation was once the Armenian city of Van. In the twilight of the Ottoman Empire, many of the subject peoples, including the Armenians, became restive. They started agitating for reform or freedom or both. The Turks reacted in the usual way, with force. In 1895, many thousands of Armenians were massacred. But the empire was beginning to fall apart. A succession of wars stripped it of nearly all its territory in Europe. Only Constantinople and the surrounding area remained. As their empire threatened to disintegrate, the Turks turned to their only hope of salvation, the army. A group of officers calling themselves the Young Turks formed a secret political party to reform the empire. Ironically enough, the Young Turks at first allied themselves with Armenian and other national minorities to plan a liberal, Western-style, multinational state. But the First World War changed all that. The Turks found themselves on the side of Imperial Germany. It was the Kaiser who armed and trained their troops. And in due course, they became Germany's allies in a catastrophic war. As in Germany, nationalism and militarism stifled the first democratic stirrings. Many Armenians fought loyally in the Ottoman army Others looked toward their fellow countrymen from Russian-occupied Armenia who were fighting on the other side. Turkish suspicions were aroused. The young Turks reacted by executing the Armenian soldiers and ordering the removal of the Armenian civilian population from the war zone. 
the architects of this policy were the Minister of War, Enver Bey, and Talat Pasha, the Minister of the Interior. On the 24th of April, 1915, it became clear that their real intentions were much more sinister. 600 leading Armenian citizens were arrested in Constantinople, the modern Istanbul. Some of them, people who'd actually helped the young Turks to power. They were summarily executed. The Armenian intelligentsia, the men who might have organized resistance, had been disposed of. Talat had sent a coded telegram to young Turk party cells, a telegram whose authenticity is accepted by everyone except the Turks. The government has decided to destroy completely all Armenians living in Turkey. An end must be put to their existence, however criminal the measures taken may be. And no regard must be paid to either age, sex, nor to conscientious scruples. Minister of the Interior, Talat. The deportations, according to what the German missionaries from that area told us, were ordered by the Turkish government. They said uh, it had been revealed to them by German government officials that these deportations were necessary to remove all minority groups from Turkey. And I'd see women and children and men uh, lying beside the road, dying of thirst or hunger, and uh, I could do nothing for them. The commissary of police wouldn't permit any help to be given to them. Another key witness was Henry Morgenthau, then ambassador in Constantinople of the still neutral United States. As my grandfather, related the events of 1915 to me many years later at the time when he was uh, Woodrow Wilson's ambassador to Turkey. His dealings were primarily with uh, Talat Pasha who was the Minister of Interior and there was just no question, there was no question in my grandfather's mind that the extermination of the Armenian people was a calculated policy of the Turks. All through the spring and summer of 1915, the deportations took place. In some villages, placards were placed ordering the whole Armenian population to present itself in a public place at an appointed time. In other places, no warning was given. The gendarmes would appear before an Armenian house and order all the inmates to follow them. They would take women engaged in domestic tasks without giving them a chance to change their clothes. The police fell on them like the eruption of Vesuvius at Pompeii. Women were taken from their wash tubs. Children were snatched out of bed. Bread was left half baked in the oven. The family meal was abandoned, partly eaten. Children were taken from their schoolrooms, leaving their books open. And the men were forced to abandon their cattle and their plows on the mountainside. Even women who had just given birth were forced to leave their beds and join the panic-stricken throng. Such things as they could snatch, a shawl or a few scraps of food, was all that they could take. It is absurd of the Turkish government to assert that it ever seriously intended to deport Armenians to new homes. The treatment which was given the convoys shows that extermination was the real purpose of Enver and Talat. They said, you have to leave the house and go. Poor grandfather was 70 years old. 
grandmother, 60 years old. And he, they wanted to take us too. But how could we walk? We were very little children. But they got a car, not car, a cart. Yeah, yeah. No, a mule, no, mule. with a mule. They put us all in and some our furniture, not furniture, only the beds, and some food to eat. And they took us out of our house. Everything was gone, and we were gone too. So we never saw my uncles and my father. We heard they were dead or they killed in the army. Photographing the deportations was an offense punishable by death, but some brave people took the risk, including a German traveler who from his hotel room window recorded the forcible removal of the Armenian population from one small town. Most of the very few photographs which survive were taken by German missionaries or German officers like the later peace campaigner Armin Wegner. As an officer of the Turkish army for the wounded soldiers, I had no difficulty to enter the camps and I make many photographs. Here is a photograph where you see Armenian priests to make the grave for the dead. And uh, I remember that one of these priests said to me, once I was a priest, and now I am a lamb who is gone to be killed. Poor grandfather, grandmother, it's good they had money to buy us the water and some food wherever we stopped. And I was crying, crying. I was, I was saying, I want my father, my father. My mother used to slap me and say, be quiet now. And at last we went to a Syrian desert. A black tent they gave us, we put a black tent and we were under the black tent. My grandfather went, bought some vegetables, some bread and some watermelon. It was summer. We sat, sat down and we ate. And my grandmother said, thank the Lord, thank the Lord. And my grandfather was shouting and saying, how could we thank the Lord? How could we thank him? We are all in the desert. And we crossed the Euphrates. They drove us across the Euphrates. The Turks, the soldiers. And then we camped there for a day or two, and they took my brother, big brother, away. He must have been older, much older. And we never saw him again. So we picked up whatever we had, and the poor little donkey packed the stuff on that and moved. By the late summer of 1915, these straggling columns numbered hundreds of thousands of people and stretched from central Turkey all the way to the Syrian desert. Dragging themselves painfully along week after week, they were reduced to shuffling bundles of rags. We got to near to Ersingan and uh, there my grandmother couldn't come anymore she just was too worn out and starved hungry so we left her right there and went on because we were driven Oh, 
all of a sudden my mother got sick, my brother got sick, my sister got sick, all typhoid fever. And so my grandfather took me to their tent that I may not develop typhoid fever. They all passed away in one year. The Turks created so-called special organizations made up partly of criminals and partly of Kurdish tribesmen with an eye for loot. They preyed on the defenseless columns. The Kurds would come down and happened before and we were told by other people that, that if we're on the, on the you know, march that they would grab the kids, babies, and throw them in the lighted bushes, which they did, and I saw one. And uh, then we went, we went on, and of course the Kurds had taken everything that we, we had. And we got down to Agen, and uh, we found a place, we were driven into the city, we found a place where my nurse, mother, little brother and I stayed. And since we had no, nothing, nothing to sell, nothing to eat, I was sent out to see if I could beg something. And of course, I couldn't beg much. When I came back, why my mother wasn't there and my brother wasn't there. And I went down and mother had just dug a hole and put my brother in it. Your little brother? My little brother had died. And how old was he? He, he must have been, oh, two and a half, three years old. My brother was dug up by the dogs, and his head was one place, and his arms, legs, another place. We collected and put it all back in a sand gra grave. It was that following day or the day after when I was put in this room, I came back, and my mother wasn't there, and I went down, and she was in the water, dead. So that was the end of my family. I used to see the people in the ditches, the head cut off, the arms, the body. And I was telling to my grandmother, Grandmother, what is this? Don't look, my child. Don't look at them. Don't look. One day the turn is coming to us, she used to say. The king wants only one, one Armenian to be left in the museum. No Armenians. We are going to massacre them all, kill them all, finished. In the oil-rich desert near Deres Zor, an even worse fate awaited the survivors of the marches. Here the Turks set up what can only be called extermination camps. The Armenians could look forward to a slow death through starvation and ill use, or a quicker, more horrible one through burning. And they were taking my aunt, one of my aunts were living, she said, 600 children, they took me to, they put in a place and put gas on, on top of us, and they give, they fire. put fire and they all died. And like me, there were five gendarmes, five girls, they put us on the back of their horses, they sold us to the Bedouins, to the Arabs. 
And that's why she said, I am alive. The rest, they were burning and we were screaming, crying. I think they didn't have any conscience. They didn't have any heart. I don't know how, because she was older than me. I don't know how they did such things. Into these caves were tipped literally thousands of women and children who'd survived the marches. Only a handful lived to tell the tale of this subterranean Auschwitz. Despite the testimony of so many eyewitnesses, the Turks still insist there was no genocide. But they can't argue away the thousands of human skeletons that still exist in the desert around Deir ez Zor. Our photographer, Isabel Alsen, and I had been to see an old woman of around 100 who lived near Deir ez Zor, an Armenian who survived the massacres. She gave us the precise location of a hill at a place called Murgada on the Habur River, north of Deir ez Zor, about 70 miles north, where she said around 50,000 Armenians were murdered by the Turks, including her father and her two younger sisters. Following her precise instructions, we found the hill. It wasn't easy because the river had changed course in the course of the last 70 years. What did happen, however, is that the rains of this winter had cut into the hill of Murgada, a place which was known even to the local Syrian police as being a, a place of darkness, as one of them put it. And when we went into one of these fissures, cracks in the hill, um, Isabel was the first one to brush her hand against the side of the earth. And as she did so, she revealed a human skull. And I turned around and started brushing with my hand on the other side of the earth. And two entire skeletons interlocked, pushed, into, pushed together, um, were revealed. Um, backbone, head. In some cases, we got the impression that they must have been tied together. And indeed, the story of the massacre at that place was that the men and women were tied together by the Turks. The Armenians were tied together, pushed into the river, and one of them would be shot and would drag the others down to their deaths. The others would drown. Um, and what we had in fact found, of course, was a mass grave. And, and it was quite chilling to realize as we went on uncovering more and more skulls, which we literally took out in our hands, that, that we were at the scene of the century's first Holocaust. The Turkish government's denial that this genocide happened is similar, parallel, in some ways identical to the denial of neo-Nazis when they say that the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews never happened. This recently discovered film is another piece of evidence. It's possibly the only surviving footage of the actual deportations. It shows Armenian orphans on the march towards Syria. Many of these children were raped or murdered. Others were sold to Bedouin tribesmen. Most perished in the caves of Deir ez Zor.
The destruction of the Christian community in Turkey continued after the end of the First World War. Greek populated Smyrna, the biggest Christian city of the Ottoman Empire, was put to the torch. The last surviving Armenian community also lived in Smyrna. Protected by French warships, they, like the Greek inhabitants, took to the boats, never to return. Out of the ruins of the Ottoman Empire rose Kemal Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey. His state, built as it was on the ideal of military virtue, couldn't admit to the shame of the genocide, even though it wasn't directly responsible for it. Uh, of course, during this uh, move, uh, some of those uh, who were asked to leave the area, they suffered, no doubt about it. And in some cases, uh, possibly, the Turks who were being killed, they defended themselves too. So both sides suffered, you know, from the events, but the allegation which is made that uh, one and a half million people are massacred, there is a genocide, this is entirely a big lie of the century. But all over the Middle East, in the 1920s, there were thousands of Armenian orphans who'd experienced the genocide in their own flesh. With the Bolsheviks snuffing out the independence of the former Russian Armenia and putting an end to free speech there, it was left to these children, who were later resettled all over the world, to keep the memory of the genocide fresh. Some orphan children came to an Armenian school that had been set up in Constantinople in 1879 and finally ended up here, in Paris. Many of these children are the descendants of those orphans. The twin facts of the genocide and their survival of it are of immense psychological importance to the Armenians, as indeed is the Holocaust to the Jews. Armenian children here, as in countries around the world, experience the genocide directly through the memories of survivors. Madame Yuga Per Eftian can recall for them the horror of people burned to death in the caves near Deres Zor. <laughs> Arab Megaf in the Bidi Purna in the Neder to Nardo de Sassi, Arab Peran, Arab Peran Sorverei, to Nardo de Sassi, Mitobir in the Sea, yes, Sadgesa Torin Vecho, Sadgesa, Arun Vazet Chagades, Cassin Quarrel, Ishtesem, Graga de Veren, Guidian Gorzo, so full of Tram, Tram, Tram Gesangor, Tram Dovek, in the Gab Mega, a Sabor. Fulususav, Fulusmaltaramusele, Mandi Fulususi, Meka Shabi Carvras, Hakusneris by Rebor, Boschman, and Mahaknim. See, until Sisav, Tunim Kushesav, a Kushdamus Pamudur Haknim were Kidam Kushdamusi, a Sabor Mohammedim for a year song, and for two Kushesav. In the Shuvam Maga Bes Meshkes, in the Ire Horyak for the Ganal Werner, Cassius Tursan is in the Atoren, Cassano Chosha, Moskeres, Watcher Homerink, Odem Manaserem. At this verse, you for the Savad Adbese, Memonal, the Sam Gendarma Muguka. You for Gendarma Muguka in Kapaha Barabo. Yes, a Cassi at Mortaz Gunig Nerun, Sojoklerun, Mecho Bargesa, Kedina. Kuzetskes, a stepka, shat, 
But it's not enough for Armenians simply to remember the genocide. If its ghosts are to be exorcised, they need the world, and that includes the Turks, to accept the reality of it. For a brief period in the 80s, frustration at the world's indifference led some of them into acts of terrorism. Kemal Khan, the Turkish consul general, was driving his car to work when he stopped at a traffic light near the Los Angeles Country Club. Two men approached his car, one on each side, and they pumped a dozen bullets into Khan and ran away on foot. Right after the shooting, a caller told news services that the shooting was the work of Armenian nationalists, a protest for the 1915 massacre of one and a half million Armenians, a slaughter that the Turkish government has never admitted. Almost immediately after the genocide, the Armenian community in the United States of America started to fight the Turkish cover-up. In America, in 1983, a feature film was made based on Franz Werfel's famous novel, which tells how some Armenian villages heroically resisted the Turks until rescued by a French fleet. Originally, MGM planned to film the novel as early as 1934. The Turks immediately brought pressure to bear on the company and on the US State Department. They were successful. The film was dropped. The Turkish ambassador wrote a letter of congratulation to the State Department. It is an agreeable duty for me to extend to you my hearty thanks and appreciation for the efforts you have been so kind to exert. You have created an excellent impression in Turkey. The voices of Armenian Americans have been increasingly heard in recent years. They want their government to recognize the reality of the genocide and put pressure on Turkey to compensate the victims. Justice means for uh, the Turks to recognize what they did and to give some type of reparation, somewhat like the Germans did to the Jews during World War II. The world recognizes the Jewish genocide, but they have not looked at the Armenian genocide. If they looked at the Jew Armenian genocide, there might never have been a Jewish genocide. We want the land that um, Turkey has kept for 60 years. You want it back? Uh-huh, we want right. it back. I am reminded of those wonderful words of Yanis Yatkaev. Their campaign culminated in 1990, when Robert Dole moved a resolution in the U.S. Senate. This would have commemorated the 24th of April, 1915, as the date when the genocide began. The United Nations and the European Parliament had already done as much. It is not simply the documented evidence. I talked just this past week with an old gentleman who, when he was 10 years old, relayed to me what had happened to his family. A brutal experience that will be part of his memory the rest of his life. 
What we're talking about is not a criticism of the government of Turkey today. And I'd like to make that abundantly clear. What we are talking about is a recognition of a slaughter that took place some decades ago. But we should not pretend that it did not take place. Where we have had this butchery, and that's all it can be called, whether it is Hitler's massacre of the Jews, whether it is what took place in Cambodia by the Khmer Rouge, or whether it is what took place in 1915 uh, of the Turkish uh, massacre of the Armenians. We're not saying that the Turks today are responsible. We're not saying the Germans of today are responsible. But let us remember, let us not forget. The Armenian Americans first realized that things weren't going their way when the White House stopped supporting them. Turkey had thrown its weight against the reality of history. Well, we actually worked with our grassroots. Uh, we provided an 800 number and generated 70,000 uh, telegrams and calls, uh, additional calls from Turkish Americans and others who, uh, uh, Americans who have served in Turkey in diplomatic corps and military service. Uh, they're just uh, absolutely aghast at uh, what's been happening in this anti-Turkish propaganda by the Armenian immigrants in this country. But I say we ought to stop, look, and listen before we take a fateful step here to offend a friend, to offend an ally. When we asked the Turks when we wanted the Turks to fight by our side in Korea, the Senate didn't offer a resolution. No senator offered a resolution at that time. The Turkish government's lobbying was, uh, was nothing less than, uh, than massive. Uh, first of all, they announced that all business would be put on hold with United States companies. Uh, until the resolution was defeated. Uh, a similar tactic uh, was used when a resolution passed through the House in 1984. At the time, uh, in reaction to that, the Turkish government canceled a multi-million dollar deal with Boeing, I believe, to buy Boeing jets and instead bought French Airbuses. The irony then was that, uh, that uh, France, President Mitterrand, went ahead and made some glowing statements about the need for Turkey to acknowledge the genocide in France, France's strong support uh, for recognition of the genocide. Uh, they did that. They also closed off military, U.S. military exercises in Turkey and threatened that the, the bases that the United States has in Turkey would be closed. Turkish cities today are festooned with leading American brand names. America does good business in Turkey, and the Turkish government left little doubt as to what would happen to that business if the Senate motion passed. Another technique that was used, for example, is a corporation that may have had a plant in, say, Missouri would be pressed upon to have its plant manager as well as all of the workers there uh, make it clear to the senator that if he voted for this bill, then they'd lose their jobs. Turkey's importance to NATO has been used by successive Turkish governments as a lever against the recognition of the genocide. Today, her role as a secular model for new Islamic Turkish-speaking states like Azerbaijan makes her even more sensitive to the taint involved in the word genocide. Turkey's friends in the U.S. military were also thrown into the Senate battle. The uh, head of a major defense industry in this country, who happens to be a longtime friend, called me and said, uh, uh, I don't understand this, but the Turkish government feels very, very strongly you could do me a personal favor if you would uh, vote against this. And I'd like to do a favor for my friends. I, you know, we all like to do favors for my friends. But I had to tell them that I disagreed with them on this one. <laughs> None of us, not one, is in a position to point the finger at Turkey and say that was a genocide. 
Yes, we killed some American Indians. It wasn't a genocide. We're saying that we can't talk about this genocide. It might embarrass somebody. We can only talk about genocides from here on that don't embarrass anybody. You, you find me somewhere they've killed a million people or 500,000 or 100,000. And if they don't embarrass anybody and don't threaten any American company's profit margin and don't require a few hours studying the facts, then we'll bring it up and pass it. Mr. President, uh, Hitler asked when he was planning the final solution of the Jews, who remembers the Armenians? Uh, let us prove Hitler wrong again and by adoption of this resolution, remember the Armenian genocide. Only 48 U.S. senators voted to remember the Armenians. 51 voted against. It didn't pass because uh, it's not based on historical fact. It's based on one-sided emotional uh, story uh, told by people who uh, have immigrated to this country and uh, embroidered uh, the, uh, the Civil War story back in uh, 1915 uh, to generate what we call a mythical uh, story of genocide and to uh, to give it the uh, the authority of a resolution in the in the greatest deliberative body in the world uh, for us was unthinkable of course we uh, we worked uh, to uh, to stop it it didn't pass because it's not true that's why uh, for all of us it's uh it's probably the defining issue of being Armenian that we survived, that our family survived this genocide. My grandmother, uh, for example, who was maybe 10 or 12 years old, saw her whole family wiped out, except for, uh, well, she actually saw her nine-year-old cousin, she saw bayoneted in the back uh, by Turkish soldiers. She was then sold into slavery in Turkey, uh, escaped. Uh, made it to Beirut. Uh, my grandfather wrote a letter to the orphan and said, by the way, I want to marry a woman from this village. Uh, they got married and, and that's how I'm here. Those are the kinds of things that never leave you. Uh, never leave you. They, they just burn in your mind. And so no Armenian, I don't think, will ever uh, forget. In the newly independent, hard-pressed Republic of Armenia today stands this monument to the victims of 1915. These Armenians have rescued the testimony of many tragic eyewitnesses from oblivion. They are confident that the truth about the genocide will one day prevail. Next week on Compass, American Roman Catholic Bishop Rembert Weakland, who stirred up a storm of conservative protest during his recent visit to Melbourne. That's Weakland versus the Conservatives next Sunday night on Compass.